Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Rangers TV. We've got a packed show for you today. Um, we've got a review of the Atrix Lapdoc, or an overview of it. We've got e a Digital Whiskey's EDC video. We've got a review of the Soldier's Pocketbook. And a new section that we're going to start calling Tactical Philosophy. Um, which is, a, in most part, a tribute to uh, Sean Kennedy and the Rant TV crew for putting together you know, all the mental toolkit that you'll need to survive adverse conditions, not just survival, but just in everyday life. And uh, you may notice there's a little bit of a note to him. Uh, and that's a big thank you, because when I started listening to Sean Kennedy on Rant TV and uh, patrolling, I really didn't know what I was doing with my life, and it really helped me out. Some of the ways he had of thinking around a problem were absolute dynamite. So I'm trying to um, point you in the direction of that and add in the things that I've learned since. So hopefully, you know, you'll get something out of it. But I've added a, a little bit of green screen, green screen trickery to that to make it a bit more interesting to look at. And because it's a new technique, I've managed to learn how to do with all the video equipment. And uh, hopefully at some point there'll be a how to make the videos type thing. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Run VT. So um, what we're going to do now is give you a brief overview of the, Atri the Motorola Atrix lap dock, which was originally developed for the Motorola Atrix phone. Now these things are kind of getting hard to source and find, but I will put a link um, to an eBay seller or pro possibly uh, an Amazon seller in the description below. Now it was originally designed to turn the Motorola Atrix phone into a sort of a laptop. Like, an, like a Motorola style Android laptop sort of thing. But some clever people um, realized that because it has a standard USB interface and a standard HDMI interface, it'd be very useful um, for the Raspberry Pi single ball computer. And I'm a huge fan of these because they keep updating them, they keep bringing on the hardware. But it'll also be useful for other single ball computers, such as the QB board or the uh, Orange Pi. And Unlike Raspberry Pi, the QB board and people like that, the single board computer folks, they are always interested in increasing the onboard RAM and the processor power and stuff like that, something which the Raspberry Pi Foundation doesn't seem all that interested in, which is a crying shame because a single board computer with a quad core processor, if you started to add some decent RAM to that, you've got a real laptop alternative and you can also sort of pocket them, you can stick them in, you, you, you can palm them away, you can build an OS for them and sort of chuck them to one side and have an emergency computer in case all your computer stuff goes down. Um, the cool things about the Atrix laptop, and we're going to cut in a minute to a, like an, a top view so you can have a detailed look at it, is that it provides a whole bunch of stuff to the Raspberry Pi, meaning you don't have to plug it into anything else. So first and foremost, it's got a keyboard, a display, and a trackpad. So that frees up at least three, well, two of your USB ports on the Raspberry Pi and uh, the video port. It also has speakers built into it, which you can switch on now with the latest version of Pixel. You can software switch them to headphones or speakers, which is very handy. It's a bit of a faff in that it doesn't auto-detect, but it does mean that you can either just listen to your stuff on speak on headphones or you can use the onboard speakers. And also, and this is more useful for owners of the Raspberry Pi Zero and Zero W, which cost um, £5 and £10 respectively. Um, it will also add two more USB ports. So the actual connection for the Raspberry Pi Zero um, has only, yeah, there's only one USB port on it. There's one connector for power and one for USB, which means that you've either got to connect a, an all-in-one USB sort of keyboard and mouse, one of those little infrared jobbies, or, which isn't so good, or a Bluetooth keyboard and means that you don't have a mouse, or you've got to connect it to a powered USB hub to enable able to do stuff. Well, this takes takes care of you know speakers, keyboard, trackpad, and display, 
and a couple, and it gives you an extra couple of USB ports. So if you've only got the Raspberry Pi Zero, you can handily use a, a, a wireless um, USB key. It also provides power to the um, to an external hard drive. It uses the, and it also has its own onboard battery, which lasts somewhere between five and eight hours, depending on what you're doing. So it's a really useful bit kit. I'm going to show it to you now, and uh, we're going to do an overview. My one. I don't know if you can see there, has the Raspberry Pi 3 Velcro to the back of it. And there's a Velcro strip along the top where I've attached those little um, micro SD card adapters to turn it into an SD card. It's because the SD card's bigger and it, you can attach Velcro to it. And you can slide in, you have a look at that, you can slide in a micro SD card into each one. This means you can have multiple distributions. I mean, this one here, with the little hazard tape marking on it, which is how I use hazard tape for everything, um, is the Retro Pi. So I can swap out the onboard micro USB hard drive, sorry, micro HDMI hard drive, and just change over distros. So I've got three space for three or four of these on the top. Got a little connector here, that's a, an official Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi connector. And uh, literally all that happens is that you plug in there's a USB cable here, which plugs into the power and one of the USB ports to give you a combination um, keyboard and mouse. And the HDMI connector goes here, and that plugs into the onboard HDMI connector. So if we turn it round for you, I'll just bring it online, and there you've got a really nice sort of, I think it's a 10-inch screen, that gives you a really good display and allows you to play videos and use your Raspberry Pi. However, that's not where it ends. This will actually plug into um, my Canon 600D, so you can actually use it as a remote monitor, a remote screen, so you can see how sharp the focus is, and you can get a good idea of what all the settings are, and you can keep it, as you can't see the monitor, I'm j literally holding it in my hand, I'm, I'm, the actual lap dock could be well out of sight if you needed to do some filming. You can also, if you've got an old desktop PC, and you're prepared to sort of work out all the little bits of cabling, do a, like an old PC, PC will have a VGA connector. You can actually run a VGA connector into an HDMI converter into the, uh, the Atrix lap dock. And that would give you a KVM for an old desktop PC. So if you've got an old desktop PC tucked out of the way, you could have a couple of trailing cables, leave your desk completely free so you don't have to have a monitor for it. And then when you do need to access that machine or you want to interrogate it or fix it, you've got a, like a, K, a mobile KVM thing, so you don't have to plug in endless stuff to it. You can literally run a USB cable out of it. You can run a, um, a, a VGA to HDMI converter, and you'll get like a whole KVM with a widescreen, albeit a small one, but it'll mean you can take the lap dock from machine to machine if you've got the right cable set up. So the downside is that uh, you've got like a a bit of a price issue. These run at about £100, so about $120. You can order them. They're worth having uh, the because if you wanted to get the Raspberry Pi top kit, that on its own will cost you $300. It's really massively expensive for what it is. But what you do have here is a machine that you can literally swap stuff out of. Now you can do that with a Pi top, but it's not as sleek, it's not as convenient. It means that if you've got uh, various models of Raspberry Pi, you can just rehook them up into that. You could even Velcro a Raspberry Pi Zero to the back of it so you could swap in between the two if you wanted to do projects or anything like that or program it to run some IoT thing. So it's pretty handy. So you could do an awful lot with this. You could even rig in an Arduino. Um, you could power the Arduino off the Raspberry Pi and do, use that as the connection. You can do all sorts of stuff. We've got, that's why I put Velcro on the back of here. Uh, it's a bit of a plug for industrial Velcro. And I might put a, an eBay or an Amazon link through that. So uh, we're going to cut to the overhead view and you can have a more detailed look at this. So this is the laptop in close-up. You can actually see this is currently running YouTube. It's got the Raspberry Pi Model 3 Revision 2, which has got a quad-core processor, about only one gig of RAM, I think. And uh, it's running YouTube, it's got built-in Wi-Fi, and it's just bolted into the back of the Atrix laptop. And you can see it's got uh, all the features of a laptop, and it basically fixes all the niggly things about Raspberry Pi. But also, um, it's got a few interesting features, in that uh, 
the mouse pad has got a little light in the top left hand corner here you, know, you see that and if I double tap it it will actually turn itself off so you can actually browse around the internet if you want to use an external mouse so uh, we'll just fire it up So you can actually see that's running. I don't mind plugging John Oliver a bit. It sometimes she takes longer to buffer. We'll just turn this off. She says while she was sleeping on a boat at the Cannes Film Festival. So yeah, that's a bit current. So yeah, so it'll happily stream data and all that sort of thing and, and run, run your videos. And we'll just have a quick tour of the connections on the back. So if you look at the back, let's get this thing into focus. So if you look at the back, there's two extra USB ports and the power connector. On this little flip out hinge, you've got the HDMI and the USB and my, let's see if we can get that into focus, and my collection of SD cards as you can see there. It's not perfectly in focus, but you get the idea. Um, so it's got speakers, and they're built into these two grills here. And uh, yeah, so it adds a few extra USB ports, adds speakers, keyboard, mouse, and video, and it adds a powered hub, and I'll just uh, show you that. So we're just going to plug in uh, my external video here, my external uh, hard So we're just going to plug in my external hard drive here, into the USB port, get that to detect it. Which it does. And you can see, or well, can you bring that to focus? It's a bit of a pale screen. And you can see it's bringing up the uh, contents of that hard drive, which is something you wouldn't normally be able to do on a Raspberry Pi Zero because there just isn't enough power, hence the need for a powered USB hub. So what you're really looking for, looking at is an all-in-one solution to providing all the bits and bobs you normally need, need to plug into a base computer. So if you're someone that fixes computers and you want to make sure that the monitor and the keyboard and the mouse, you can just literally swap it out for all of this. And if you're a fan of single board computers, you've now got an all-in-one solution, as well as a remote camera monitor and all sorts of other things. It, it really is very interesting to use. So that's my overview of the um, Atrix lap dock. Uh, as you can see, this one came from Israel. They're becoming harder and harder to find. That's why I thought I'd put the review of it and the overview of it into the um, series as early as possible. So that if you did want one, you've at least got a chance of getting hold of one. Thanks very much for watching. Okay. Time to put on some new pants, so today is as good as a day to make an EDC video. Going through the pockets one by one, in no particular order, on this carabiner and a little, little, bit, little bit of a belt loop. You have my keys, uh, a whistle, this is a, can you see this? Probably not. Focus. Mm, that's that's not gonna work. Anyway, this is a nightcore whistle. Uh, 
very loud, very sturdy, good for uh, making a lot of noise. Yes, it will hurt your ears when you blow hard on it. This is a UV flashlight. No real particular particular reason to have this, but it's cool. Uh, a Phoenix CL05. That is a little bit of a well, it's called a lip light because I know it looks like lipstick, but mm, very functioning little light. Uh, there's a white setting low. And this is uh, actually actually less light than full moonlight, and it has a high output. This is more than than more than a full moon. Red, a strobing red, green, strobing green, and then is uh, then it has an SOS function. Pretty much useless. Um, I like the light. It run both these lights run on a single triple A battery. The one with this little light here, I want to bust it open and hack it a little bit because I'm assuming it has an RGB LED in there because the white light that it puts out doesn't really show well on the camera, I think. It's this typical weird light that RGB LEDs give off and it only has the white and the green available. What I want to do with this one is make it so that it has a low, high strobe both in the white, green, the red, and blue, assuming that I can get this, that there is an RGB LED in there and I get it to work. The only problem is there is no real way of getting in here without being destructive. Uh, this plastic bit is screwed on to the metal inside. There is some glue or some adhesive or something with some sealant on the threads. So that's going to be very hard to take apart, but you know, I'm willing to give it a shot. But mm, I'm probably going to have to destroy a couple of them before I can figure out a good way to do it. And this is of course assuming that I can actually modify the insides. Now, moving on. And the other, what's next in the front pocket is a Victorinox. Well, one of those Swiss Army knives that isn't really a Swiss Army knife. Uh, this one on a detachable snap. Uh, it's either the, I think this one is the farm, farmer. Uh, this one has all. There's also another one with it. This all is a small knife. This one has you know, good sized big blade and good sized uh, wood saw or plastic saw. And then there are the two sort of not really all that useful bottle opener, screwdriver, can opener sort of combination tool. Um, don't use this a lot, but very handy from time to time. Now, this old handkerchief, self-explanatory, this also needs to go into the washing machine. Next up, a horrendous little, little sticker on the side, or paint job on the side. I got these ones because they were 10 bucks cheaper because they're just ugly on the right side. But what this is, is... Can you see that? Yes. Plasmatic lighter. Uh, for those of you wondering, do not stick your finger in this and push the button. That hurts the same way that mains electric current flowing through your body hurts. Yeah, that's the second... Yeah, yes. The, the, way, the reason why I know this is because I went, because, yeah, after five minutes after I had it, because I want to know, will this hurt? And yes, it does. Then a little pill bottle. Inside are earplugs. These ones will cancel out most of the noise. Uh, they're by the Dutch company called uh, Alpini, I think. Other brands are available. Nice nanny to make things go quiet. And that's it for this pocket. Now, moving on to the back. We have some cordage. This is, uh, I believe, it's called monkey braiding. It's tied up like this. The big advantage to this is, is that I can just pull it. Hang on. Just pull it, and now I have 
a lot of cordage and it's not going to get tangled up. Yes, it does take some time to tie it up again, but it's very handy. It's not going to turn into one big chain on this mess that's just uncontrollable. Then the other knife, Boker Plus, uh, BZ. A very neat, lightweight, small knife. Next thing that's in the pocket is my wallet that, as you can see, needs replacing. Uh, the only thing special in here is a Fresno lens and two USB sticks. One of the USB sticks is just general purpose whatever, another one is more personal stuff. Um, I also have portable apps installed on that. That's a little program that allows you to very quickly and easily run a lot of other programs that you've pre-installed on there. Really handy. Uh, this one is now next to the flashlight. This is a next torch, next, next torch K3, and <laughs> it works fine. There's nothing really wrong with it, but I don't really like it. Main reason why I don't like it is because if I'm gonna push the button now, I have no idea what's going to happen. This happens. It's on. I think it's low. Yeah, that was low. Then now it goes into strobing mode, high medium and back below. The problem with this little elite flashlight is that it has a memory function and the way that it is that it is implemented is it's uh, very easy to accidentally change it. Now you've just seen me strobe it for a while. If I push the button again what should probably happen, safe to assume, is that it goes to the high mode. I push it again, goes to medium, then low and then back to strobe. So now it goes back to strobe. Why is this? Because of the memory function. If you hold the button here for 5 seconds, it will remember this function and next time you go and use it, it will do this. Now, see that? Now it's not strobing. I leave it on for a couple seconds. I let go, I push again. But I didn't leave it on long enough. So again, again, again. This means that if I put it on this mode, let's say, I wait long enough, and now it's locked into this mode and then push it again it's this mode but if I, because it has a very proud little button here if it's in my pants pocket and I accidentally just very briefly you know, bump it a couple times like this now what's going to happen next? yeah, it's on a completely different mode unpredictable not good it, and uh... Well, other than that, it works fine, it's reliable, it's durable, it's not gonna break it's just that I need to remove its brain or something. No. And that's that for that pocket. Now, let's take off the belt. Uh, this belt is just something really cheap, but effective. Uh, first, little, first little handmade or well, homemade pouch. Some other earbuds. These ones are the ones you know, kind of custom made silicone to my ears. Uh, specific filter here that doesn't really make a lot of, that makes everything quiet but still uh, makes the audio quality real nice the only benefit over these ones compared to these ones is that these ones take a long time to take in and out these I can just shove in real quickly which comes in handy depending on what you're doing so yes I have two different kind of earbuds on me and then the next ones are the electrical earbuds because not everybody needs to listen to what I'm doing and then this next little belt pouch on here I guess some more redundant stuff in here there's a camera it's a Sony Cybershot uh, T90 I think yeah uh, this one is on its way out, the batteries are wearing out, so I'm going to replace it with something, probably the phone that I'm using to record myself right now. Now, because it is a Sony, uh, and it's an older one, it uses, as you may be able to see here, a non-standard SD card, so I have to, did I, so what did I do? I got myself a little adapter, so to get these small SD cards 
so that I can actually use the thing. And in here, this front little pocket, it has an SD card adapter to the normal size. Uh, in here, in the front pocket, there's also a little finger band-aid. Just one, I need to add some more. Then in this pocket, there's a lanyard for my glasses. Yes, I wear glasses. Don't really use these, these that often, but when you need them, you need them. Then, ubiquitous big lighter. I don't smoke, but uh, there's nothing sadder in the world than a smoker without fire. And then there is a little metal match, or blast rod, or whatever they called. The reason why I have this is because, well, just being able to blast sparks and fire and something is really cool. And if you combine this little thing with uh, this saw and a good sized knife, these both of these are attached on the lanyard, so I'm not going to lose them. You know, I'm assuming it makes ha a halfway decent survival setup. Because, let's face it, you don't really need a big-ass machete on you all the time if you're just trying to, you know, not die and start a fire to make your life a little bit better. That should do the job. Now, the last bit here is the belt. As you can see, this belt is really long for what I'm for my size. The reason why I like this nice and long is because I can take it off and use it as a strap for something else. This does mean that I do have to put a little tab on this so that I don't have to constantly thread this entire length length of extra belt material through here. No, I can just stick it in, lock it in, and we're good to go. Now, uh. And that's pretty much it, yeah. So, oh yeah, uh, the jeans, these ones, uh, it doesn't really matter, does it, but... These are the jeans that I'm wearing. If you're interested in that sort of thing, anyway, that's my EDC. Hope you like it. Uh, if you got any thoughts or ideas, you know, get in, in, get in touch with me in the normal manner. And welcome to the book bunker. Following on from last week's book review, I thought we'd have a nicer background, so I went for this. This is very me. Um, this week's book is the Soldier's Pocket Handbook, or the Soldier's Pocket Book. Retails around £10 on Amazon at the moment. Try and get the 200, 2016 version. Uh, I think this is the 2015 one. And it has uh, literally everything. Uh, it's got uh, how to patrol, how to conceal yourself, things like sniper training, uh, first aid, medical care, um, all the weapons and vehicles of the British, that's available to the British Army at the moment, including helicopters. Um, it's literally got everything. If you could memorize this book, you could essentially um, cut out all the lectures that you're liable to be given in the British Army. So yeah, so I totally recommend it. As a, as a survival book, it's a little bit above um, the SAS Survival Handbook in that it includes um, comms information like radio communications which is very handy and will teach you how to acquire sniper skills and as well as that basic marksmanship and stuff like that so really if, you've, if you're thinking that you want to do be a survivalist or you want to cope with any situation or, a, or an apocalyptic situation you want to cope with it in the way soldiers would this is kind of your book I thoroughly recommend it um, it's peanuts money for how useful it is and it gives you all sorts of um, frequencies and bands that you know on communications. It gives you how to treat gunshot wounds and blast wounds and stuff like that in the first aid section. It's basically the military version of of the SS. Well, that sounds daft. It's the military version of the SS survival handbook in that it, it copes with all sorts of stuff. Obviously, it doesn't stand on its own as a survival manual. It's not really intended to be a survival manual. It's literally a compilation of all the things that you'd be told as a soldier in the British Army. So I completely go for this. Um, maybe we'll do some excerpts or some in, inside shots. I don't know yet. Depends on how rushed I am for time. But yeah, I rate this 
Um, if you can find it as a PDF and you want to scroll through it, then great. Give it a look or look, have a look at the look inside on various books at booksellers and have a look at it. It's all black and white. I don't think there are any color plates in it. It's all like line drawings and stuff like that. It's very simple. It's designed for you to be able to read through stuff and, uh, just remember things. You know, it's got sort of tactical hand signals. It's got how to load your pack, an overview of, you know, pretty much anything that you need in the British Army. When I was interested in joining the TA and I went along to a couple of their weekends, um, literally everything they told us was in here. So, as I say, it's a good addition to your library. I would say it's a very good addition if you're looking to tactically train a group of people. And it shows you how to move, what sort of advances to make, um, how to respond to orders, everything. So, if you've already got things like the SA Survival Handbook and Food for Free, this is probably a one to look at. If you're looking at actually tactically surviving as a team or tactically responding to things, this is a very good start to your library. And we'll see you next time in the book bunker. Stand easy, Rangers. Welcome to Tactical Philosophy. This is where we will try and take all the cool bits of philosophy, all the things I've learned over the last 15 years, and boil them down into very short segments to allow you to make the good decisions that you want to make and the good plans that you want to make as a result of those good decisions. First thing is a concept called make, do and mend. Um, this was, dates back to the Napoleonic Navy in the 1800s. And Sunday afternoons, a few hours were set aside for each crew member to make, do and mend their own kit and generally fix things and make sure that everything was ready for an emergency. Now at sea, an emergency can be bad weather conditions, it can be sighting of enemy or a call to action in a situation where all hands are on deck. And at that point, if you notice that rope's frayed or your uniform doesn't fit or your shoes are, need, are in need of repair, it's way too late. So the idea is that you set aside a chunk of time each week for repairing and general maintenance of everything that you consider important. For instance, charge batteries for mobile phones, cameras, um, computers, battery power banks. Make sure that your kit is ready to go, that all your things are organized, possibly even your work bag organized for the next week, that all your things are ironed, that your boots are polished, that all the things that you rely on and all your equipment is ready to go when you need it to be. The second section of this philosophy segment is, that is devoted to lists. I am a huge believer in making a list of everything that you want to achieve in a given time period. It's extremely important that your own time is as organized as you can make it so you can achieve as much as possible with it as you can. To that end, I generally carry a small notebook. It doesn't matter what sort of notebook it is. This one's got plastic cover, so it's a little more durable and ideally it's as cheap as possible. Literally write down a list of everything you want to achieve, uh, all, the, all the tasks broken down to their smallest possible components. So instead of something big that could stop you from achieving things like tidy house, you put things like washing up, sweep floors, uh, do laundry, polish boots, charge batteries, charge radio batteries, stock food, check on preparations, all that sort of thing. You break it down to the smallest possible bit and you write it down in a list. And then as you complete each bit, you strike through it. And in this way, you overcome what would be a mountainous thing to do. Believe me, I've been stuck and sort of paralyzed by all the things that I wanted to do in a given time and then achieve none of them. It doesn't matter if you don't achieve any of the things on your list. If you write down a list and it's comprehensive enough and there are things that you need to do, if you start doing the first task, you'll be more encouraged and you'll get everything on your list done, and then some. And, and don't, be, don't be afraid to write down extra things on your list as you spot them. It's important that you get things done so that you're not paralyzed by a large job. Break the job down into small segments, strike through it, and then throw the list away once you've completed it. It's a really, really incredibly effective way of organizing your time. And I completely believe in the power of the list. That's it. Take care.